Hello. Hello. And welcome to Dream Cinema. For the past five years, the Step Jane album Silver Bullet Suicide has been released one track at a time with an accompanying video. For the next 10 months in Dream Cinema, I will be exploring each track and video with a co-host. Mr. Devon Blue Whitaker, Boy Indigo, welcome to Dream Cinema, my friend. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And I was trying to think back to when we first met, and I think it was through a mutual friend of ours, Ben Hartzell, who is a bassist, I believe. And uh, this was like probably, what, 10 years ago now? And he recommended you for a gig I was playing. And you, you were uh, kind of a session guy at the time. You still are a session guy, though, aren't you? Well, <clears throat> Not necessarily for music anymore. Last year was, uh, fortunately, was the last year that uh, I would be playing music for, for, for anyone else, which is, which is a good thing. Um, the, the freelance thing, that the shift is, um, I still do freelance, but it's, uh, it's mainly for, it's for video. Now, I, musically, I kind of focus on my own uh, music, which is a good thing. You're yeah. doing your own thing, with boy, and that's Boy Indigo. Yes, yes, it is. And, and that is essentially you, or is that a band concept? Um, it's kind of a bit. It's a. It's very much a band concept. Um, it's. It is one of those things where, like, and I know you can attest to this. Like, you, you initiate the song, mm -hmm. and then you, you know, you bring in the 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 collective, and you let them kind of add their parts to it, and you know. Um, so it is, it is, uh, it is a band in that sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the success you're having with that. And, 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 um, it's, it's also exciting to see that you're going into the video world full throttle too. <laughs> I, I noticed on your Instagram that you have, you have videographer, uh, first now and yeah. then musician second. So I imagine that was an intentional uh, decision to put that in that order is that true oh man it's uh there's definitely a psychology to everything we do um oh. and th that one was not necessarily an intentional one okay um uh, but but yes yeah yeah because you're going deep into the video <coughs> now you're you're you've got the gear you're getting more gear and of course you have always been a guy that's been amazing with gear and fascinated by, I think, by, uh, from everything. I mean, I, I was, I've been to your studio and you, you, when you take out your pedals, basically you look like you could open an up a, a pedal store. <laughs> and then you've got all kinds of synths. I don't know how many, how many synths do you have? Uh, who, who counts these things? <laughs> I don't. Uh. <laughs> You have, a, you have a boatload of sense. There was at least 10 there, and if not 20. <laughs> and, and, then, well, and, and now you're taking that to, to the camera, to, to the camera world and to the video world, film world, right? You're yeah, diving. yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I get to do, you know, but fortunately, though, the, uh, the camera world, though, um, it pays a lot better than the... Um, than, than the music world like in terms of freelance so i've got a chance to shoot a bunch of commercials and um shoot freelance for fox uh fox 40 and then got to be on a shoot a few shows and things like that um so um you know I, i've had like the privilege of doing that and it's so interesting that you and i are having this discussion regarding um you know, your video for, for Black Dove, mm -hmm. um, because being a musician and a videographer, it lends itself to, to an interesting, um, it just kind of creates like an interesting combination there that you would never really be able to get from like someone who is definitively just a musician and someone who is definitively just a videographer. You know, <clears throat> when you're having that conversation as a musician with a videographer, you know, telling them what it is you, you envision, like you have to articulate in most instances um, a feeling, you know. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing it yourself, 
it's something entirely different. So I, I think over the course of this conversation, you'll find that I have a lot of questions mm -hmm. um, that kind of relate to, to, to that very, that narrative, you know, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people know, uh, know you as a, um, as a musician, you know, mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. but like a lot of people don't really know that, like, I mean, you're, you're a brilliant videographer and director, um, so there's, there's a lot of things that you actually do in the realm of uh, videography that um, you don't see often um, mm -hmm. at all. So, yeah, I mean, I, I've got lots of questions for that. Cool, cool. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, thanks for the kind compliment, first of all. And, and thank you for um, taking the time to dive into my work, as I know we've discussed it through the years and uh, it's, it's cool to have you here on the show because you understand kind of the process now as you've become a filmmaker yourself and you kind of, under, you know how this world operates and, and it is interesting to do both. Um, and you know, some, some people feel that when you create a narrative with a song, you, li you therefore <laughs> limit it um, if you try to tell a narrative story more than an ambient collection of images. Um, but I just love story so much that I, I tend to I tend to start feeling a story coming through me, and then I want to create that story. Now my stories are not necessarily a clear narrative a lot of the time, but most people can pick out some sort of a story that's happening. With with Black Dove here, maybe it's even more of an ambient feel than than some of my other videos. But I'm excited to hear your questions if you want to just jump in on those. <laughs> Yeah, let's start off with a very easy one. So why the title Black Dove? What does that mean? Well, that's that's part of the lyric. Um, mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, I'm the prince of Minneapolis, as God is my witness. I'm a black dove. I'm a white glove. I'm a cannibal. And then it goes into I eat your heart out. So for me, um, a lot of what I, I tend to think about and I tend to want in my life, like probably most people, is peace, a sense of peace. And doves represent peace. And they represent, um, you know, Picasso's dove he painted that's with an olive branch. It's like reaching out for peace. But the reason it's a black dove, I think, is because I tend to like to go into the shadow work, uh, into the darker realms of my own mind and to see what's there and so i'm 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 here to bring peace to myself and others through my art but it doesn't always come across as this beam of light that is shining from the heavens that is going to give you this instantaneous feeling of joy and peace maybe in in, in in as you're getting to peace you have to go through some darkness before you get to the light so that's kind of a that's kind of probably where that comes from. Okay. No, I like that idea. Now, you've mentioned that when it comes to like the the video portion of what you do, um, that the narrative itself is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, <clears throat> more, I would say, ambiguous. Um, is that something? So, as, as it pertains to this particular video going into the video process for this were you doing that was that something that you were intentionally doing were you intentionally keeping the story kind of loose kind of ambiguous so that the viewer could then kind of like um you know use their imagination and, and, and kind of sculpt what the story is to them was that something you were intentionally doing or did you just not question it you just full throttle this is what i'm doing well i always write out an outline <laughs> i always create an outline the story starts to come to me and it comes to me sometimes very clearly and sometimes then it's a little more of an ambiguous type of a narrative that drops in but when i write it out i write out a very clear outline uh, on my computer and i give it to the cinematographer or whoever i'm working with that needs to have it and we try to follow that as closely as we can. And then within that, you move spontaneously, depending on what the actors are giving you, what the weather is giving you, what all of a sudden occurs on a, in a spontaneous way 
that you didn't imagine. Um, and and as far as as far as creating ambiguity, I don't try to intentionally create ambiguity. Uh, I think that um, can get you probably into so, a bunch of trouble because <laughs> it's hard it's hard enough as it is to, to not be ambiguous. But when then you get it in the box, as you know, because you edit as well, right? Aren't you editing your own stuff too? Yeah. So that's a whole other as you know, a whole other part of the story that recreates it again. Um, so when I get it in the box, again, it becomes something else. And with Black Dove, there's that big long intro before the song even starts that has a lot of, you know, quick images that are flashing. And, you know, people, I talked to some friends that I trust and I said, you know, and they, they suggested maybe cutting that out. <laughs> Um, a couple of them did, and then a couple of them kind of liked it, but I just felt that I liked the tone of that, and, and I liked how those characters were interacting, especially the hog and the boy with the face that was painted white, and how those two were acting at the beginning, and how it was setting a tone. Okay. Now, would you say that when it comes to your scripts, are you more... Um... Are you more theme driven or are you more into characters? I would say the characters are what usually interest me. You know, like mm -hmm. when I, when I, okay, so how this, this whole video started was I was in that space that you, you get in right before you go to sleep where you're just dropping into liminal land, which is a weird, cool, space between two worlds as, as I see it, between the, the waking reality and the dream reality. And I started to see the face of this, ho this giant hog and it was very dark and out of the hog was appearing smoke from all of the, the, the cranial cavities from, through the nose, through the mouth, through the ears. And then there were these cavernous eyes that had no eyes within them and smoke was coming out of that. Um, we were never able to accomplish that on set because we couldn't get the smoke through and still have the guy's head in, <laughs> in, in the mask. That was, that's a custom-made mask that was created by a beautiful artist in town, in Sacramento there. And, um, and so um, that, that's how the vision kind of started with, with this story. It was kind of a character-driven about, about this hog. And so that's that's the way that one started. And then there were other characters that, that came in, but really it depends on kind of the song and the video and maybe what I'm going through personally too, or what the society is going through collectively that I feel maybe could use some attention. Okay. No, that's a good one. Now, and this is kind of more or less my perspective <laughs> slash your question now yeah. in here like i mean it seems like there's there, there's a, a lot of patriotic kind of um there's a an overarching patriotic narrative to this and, and my question is is was in this video are we seeing you are we seeing you punish patriotism or are you protecting it mm-hmm Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question, man. Um, this was released on Inauguration Day 2017. Uh, mm -hmm. that, was, that was the day that uh, President Trump was inaugurated. And what I feel that he, he represented to me at the time, and, and in many ways still represents, is um, the culmination of the American swine. Um, and it's not that other presidents weren't the American swine either, but here we have a, a guy who was on a reality TV show who is now the president of the United States, and he gave us a chance to really look at ourselves, in my opinion. And I don't care if you are a left swinger or a right swinger, what you got to do was look at an American swine that we all tend to be, and it, it mostly manifests itself in how we spend our money, because I think that's where our vote counts the most. Uh, our mentality with where we're 
spending our money and that's that's how our vote counts because a lot of people argue and it's a good argument that um america is not even run by the politicians it's run by the corporations the ones that are kind of constantly giving us things to consume so as far as being a patriot i'm i am not a flag waver but i'm also conscious of what i have here in this country because a lot of people that put down on America are taking a lot of things for granted, I think, that they have, that are, that are some things that they would not have in other countries. Uh, and so, but I do think that you can be a patriotic person and still criticize your country and try to make it better. Okay. That's kind of a long answer and a little bit convoluted. <laughs> So your answer with regard to are you punishing or protecting patriotism, the, the answer is like you're, you're saying you're just you're shining a light on on like on the hog, you know, for better or for worse. You know, this is yeah. these are elements that exist yeah. here within within the country. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm driving through from back from Utah a couple months ago. I'm driving through and, you, and from Utah to the desert where I, I, I'm abiding now that you pass through Vegas and as you're passing through Vegas there is a giant golden building with that's made of mirrors okay and there on the top of this building is the at that time the president of the United States name T R U M P on the top of this golden tower i mean this felt so biblical like the golden calf worship to me it just felt like the, is this real? Is this what we're living in right now? And um, I feel that um, maybe there are certain things that President Trump did that were positive for the country. Um, and I feel like maybe we never got to see some of those things or hear some of those things because he was so obnoxious. He, 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 he ranted so hard on social media and other places that any good he did, he even took away from himself. But here again, the American, there is your golden calf with a mirror that you can use to look at yourself and there's his name on top. And it just, it's just, um, I think what he did inadvertently is actually bring about an awareness for uh, civil rights issues even though he wasn't, I don't think, consciously trying to do that. I just through, think through his nat natural um, way of being, he kind of spurred on these, this revolution in the women's movement, in the Black Lives Matter movements, in other movements that got people to, to bring things to light that maybe wouldn't have been to light if this guy and who he was was not there. So change happens in, 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 I think, in the world in ways that is, is very strange and not always necessarily conscious on the inst in the part of the instigator. Hmm. Okay. I like, I like that. So all of those elements are kind of like representing themselves in the Black Dove music video. Okay. In now, yeah, in different ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, there is... Being being a musician, um, I would imagine, and then being a videographer, I would imagine that your creative process is 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 different um, from one instance to the other. Can you let's talk about the music? Uh, can you tell me what your process is when when it's time for you to create a song? Now, when I ask that that question, let me be a little bit more specific. Is there something when you sit down to at an instrument? Is there something you're searching for like is there you sit down and you think consciously i want to write a song about this or do you just put your hands on the instrument and you surrender to whatever that song is like what is your process um when it comes to music man it's become more music driven than lyric driven now the the, the longer i spend time with an instrument or with mu with music um, it, the, the more the music sort of seeps into me. 
I used to be just a, more of a poet and, and want to use the music as a medium just to get my story out there that was a, a, a written or verbal story. And so now I'll be playing a little riff on the piano or the keyboard or a guitar and the story can start to come, come to me. Um, with Black Dove, um, you know, this was four or five years ago now <laughs> that the song came. And so it's a, it's a bit of a challenge to kind of even remember how that particular one came to me. But really, I was thinking in terms of the human animal, human as an animal. Uh, and I'm the king of Babylon. In the story in the Bible, uh, the, the, the king of Babylon was, um, was a guy who was so arrogant and so full of himself that God sent him out into the fields to eat the grass like an animal and to wander around. And so I'm the king of Babylon felt like the, okay, we're, we're animals in a certain sense. But then now as I look back on it four or five years from now, I think, well, maybe that's a discredit to animals. <laughs> Because animals usually don't take more than they need. You know, most animals will just, they'll kill a deer, they'll eat it, and they'll digest it, and then they'll go look for some more prey. They won't stockpile 20 deer up in their, you know, caves. This doesn't happen very often unless they need to do something like that. So uh, I kind of wandered from your que your original question, but for this song... The process was, I think, just the idea of, of the animal, and and then that riff came, da, 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 you know, and and the, and the bass. Or, sorry, that's the audio, and then the video or the uh, bass line was a little bit different than that. Okay, so now, what was the process for video? Now, I think you kind of touched on that a, a a little bit when you said that you know you were kind of. You know, that place where you're kind of going to sleep and then the idea of the, the, the pig and his, you know, smoking from his pores kind of thing. But yeah. generally, typically, what is your process for, 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 for making videos? Yeah, I, I don't know if there's a tip, if there's a typical process. Um, I, I get, well, I guess if, you know, I'll, I'll start to imagine characters. So. I'm the king of Babylon. And then I'm like, I found a king of Babylon with long hair. I grow my hair long. That's what happened to the king of Babylon in the story of the Bible. He kept growing his hair longer and longer and became like a beast of the field. And then I'm like, and I'm the queen of England too. I keep my children at the zoo. That's the second verse. So then I thought, well, I need a queen of England. And then there's another friend of mine who just has a very stately, queenly appearance and so I guess it goes back to what we we're talking about before with um, being character driven almost, you know, and, and finding these people that fit the role and I'll find them and they'll they'll excite me. Somebody will just completely I'll get completely absorbed in their not just their appearance, but their vibe, everything about them. And I'll want to work with them. And most of the time they say yes, luckily. And we'll, then, then the story will start to be crafted after that, m maybe. Or maybe I'll think of the story at the same time. Um, with this one, I think I was really interested in how that pig was shaving the head of that kid. Um, there's something about somebody's head getting shaved that seems like s super disrespectful in one sense and super... Um, like taking away personality, like the military. Like when you go to the military, they, they get you in there, they shave your head, you're part of this team. And I think part of that is really cool because maybe you work as a group. And then part of that seems like it's also demoralizing or it takes away who you are. And so that kid, you know, and that was, it was the pig was being violent and aggressive with taking him down. The kid didn't want to be shaved, you know, by all appearances. So then, you know, it comes around to, well, what happened in the end of the story? Well, the kid comes back and, and tears that pig apart. <laughs> it comes back to bite him. Right. Yeah. Okay. So your process um, is 
so uh, again we said that you know you love the characters mm -hmm. so what you do is you you find the characters that kind of meet up with the the lyrics and depending on the the vibe of the the actors or the cast mm -hmm. that kind of will determine like how that por portion of the story evolves so you would say and i and you said this earlier on that you know as as a director when you're when you're in these these situations you, you kind of have to you know acquiesce to what like the weather is uh, uh, allowing for what the environment is allowing for right. and what the and and now in this instance what what, what your cast is doing mm -hmm. so it seems like you tend to be more of a um you do have a very specific set of shots but you're you're pliable you you're, you're able to bend when circumstances uh, require it yeah you have to be and you know i've worked with this one guy sean christopher as a, as a cinematographer on many of projects and he brings ideas to me too uh shout out to him for this and also shout out to uh, dylan wright who was the other other cinematographer on this set um the luxury i had on this set which i don't often have because i normally shoot with such a small crew is that um there were a lot of people doing different jobs and i could just sit there and direct and uh, and I there were times when I was in in the scenes, of course, and so then I didn't have as much of that ease of directing. But when we were filming the hog in the space there, it felt so nice just to be able to focus on my one job of directing and other people could do all of these other things. And then you can even open yourself up to more spontaneity in a certain way because you're, you're able to focus and see that something, somebody over here, this actor is doing this. Well, let's, let, let's highlight that. Let's bring that in. I mean, do you, now let's talk about your process a little bit too. When you're, when you're working, do you map it all out or do you, or do you, um, what do you do? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I kind of, um, I map it all out. I have like a, a storyboard where I, put things together and there's a series of shots for the most part though um the story really kind of unfolds more in the box i would i would say i mean you uh, create a you know a definitive theme mm -hmm. um but the actual story um for me always unfolds uh when it's time to to, to be doing the the editing Mm, you know, okay. so mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely different. Now, <clears throat> a question that I have, because based off of my experience with this, I've got a, a question for you. And, and it's, um, do you feel more uh, comfortable being behind the camera? Or do you feel equally as where do you feel more, more comfortable at behind the camera or in front of it? Uh, both. I like both really equally. It's, it's on. I mean, I've, I started off as an actor in theater in, in uh, Sacramento in small little theaters. And, and that, um, that's always just kind of been there to want to express myself in that way. And then the more I got into it, the more I, I just basically realized I'm, I'm an artist um, more than an, uh, um, an interpreter, I guess, is, is one way to look at it. And so I felt like I have all of these ideas for movies and films and videos and, and songs and stories. And I don't want to go, aver you know, go stand in line with 200 people in Los Angeles to try to get a McDonald's commercial. Um, I'd rather be I'd rather be broke and living somewhere doing telling my own stories. <laughs> and you're not even guaranteed you're going to get that McDonald's commercial anyways. Uh, and so it, it became more and more obvious that what brings me satisfaction is to, is to tell these stories, you know, to, and then, so you start to write and then you start to direct. And um, the, the, the challenge for, for an indie filmmaker is, is budgets always, you know, I mean, because you, you, it's hard to afford everybody you would like to afford to, to run all of the parts of the puzzle that need to go together. I mean, that gets into the thousands of dollars of range in a second, you know, uh, and, and most of the time you're not going to have that many people necessarily even watching your videos unless you get lucky someday. So it's not going to even pay for itself. So why do why the hell do we do all this? 
<laughs> for me, I'm talking to myself, you know, um, there must be some weird ass compulsion that keeps pushing some people to keep telling stories, even though you're not making any money. <laughs> you know, I mean, it sounds like you're turning your videography more into a thing that can make you some money, which is cool. Um, and for music videos, there, I mean, what's the money in that? Maybe somebody else will hire you to do their music video, which, you know, that would be cool. Uh, you know, a big, a big band comes along and says, I like Devon Whitaker's vibe and his, his, what he's creating. Let's, uh, let's hire him to do, you know, our video. I mean, wouldn't that turn you on? You know, I mean, the more I do this, uh, the more I don't like the idea of doing it for anyone else. Um, mm, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 as artists, we're always put in that position to where, like, our ability is leveraged, uh, leveraged for the prospect of, of making money for someone else, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's like, you know, I don't mind doing the commercial jobs. I don't mind doing the other freelance video things. Like, those are okay. But uh, make no mistake, if I could make that money off of just my own art, I would prefer it. And I mean, ultimately, that's 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 kind of the goal. Um, but before you can arrive at that echelon, like, I mean, you need to be able to, like, keep the keep the lights on, you know, keep food in your belly. So. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's always the trick. I've always done other jobs, but, but I was doing advertising for a while as an actor, and then I just, it just wasn't sitting with me properly. It didn't, it just was not feeling good. And, it, and my agent was, my agent was awesome. They were cool, nice people sending me out. And I just, at a certain point, I'm like, this is not, I don't want to spend my life doing that anymore. And, and I'll have to then do some other gig. And I did, and, and so I did teaching because I have a degree and so I could do that. And then I could pay for all of these other things I do, you know, but the, you know, my car is like 20 years old <laughs> and I spend all my money paying cinematographers and buying gear and, you know, and like I have, there's a nice camera and, and a, you know, so that's that's where my money goes. <laughs> you know, you know, and 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 I'm cool with that. I'm down with that. You know, and and I'll, I'll if I can go to my grave doing what I believe in most of the time, that's cool too. Um, you know, I'm I'm down with I'm down with that. You know, leaving um, I guess some sort of a, a legacy of of work that you can leave and say this is this is my contribution to the world this is this is this is my gift to you you know however many people see it that's almost up to god man <laughs> i can try everything i mean we've talked about this before like we try all the angles to, to to share our work and at the end of the day um it almost feels like you just have to surrender and say well okay angels it's yours now. I've done everything I can, you know? I mean, right. I mean, how do you how do you deal with that because it's hard sometimes <clears throat> when you it's it's hard sometimes when you put tons of effort into something and then it just goes out there and kind of disappears into the ether. Um psychologically, spiritually, if you will, even, how do you deal with that kind of a thing in your work? You know, the it's the same thing for for music um, too, and I think it's the I think there's this overarching theme for musicians, and it's um, you have to get used to the heartbreak. You know, like you <laughs> you can't you can't be an artist uh, nowadays without having the the, the heartbreak. And the yeah. reality is is um, you will lose more days than you win but i think the truth is is it's um you only have to win once you know mm, and mm, um mm. i think by way of authenticity and attrition i think if, if you just keep being uniquely yourself and keep doing this thing that i, I think that there is an audience out there for all of us you know mm, I, and mm. <clears throat> it might some of us are lucky and it happens on the very first bit of content we put out. And for some of us, it's it's the very last bit of content we put out. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, um, 
because of the level of saturation that exists out mm. there mm. and all of the artistic fields, yeah. you know, we have to be honest in the sense that like, Anyone can make a great song. Everyone has made a great song. Anyone can make a good video. Everyone has done that. <clears throat> but your ability to consistently do that is the thing that ultimately will separate you from the herd. And because you have the unique ability to do both, therein lies the, the opportunity for you, you know? And, um, you know, so it's, um, it is heartbreaking. I mean, it, <laughs> it can be, but you know, but, but two, two words that you touched on there, uh, saturation is interesting to think about now. And then also, uh, I also think, and I've, I've dwelled a lot on definitions of success. What does it mean to be successful? Um, and I've had to look at that very closely over the years because of the heart heartbreak that goes into all of this, uh, all of this um, art we do and putting it out there and then, you know, it falls flat sometimes. So it's come back to me for a lot of times to process. And, and I've, 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 talked about, I've talked about that a lot on these on, on this show before, so I don't want to grind it into the ground, but um, that, if that can be, become paramount, then the work becomes a lot more satisfying for me. If I can realize that what I'm doing here is important with these people. What I'm doing here in this conversation with Devon right now is mo more important than anything else I'm doing right now in this moment, sharing this, these thoughts. Uh, it releases me from a lot of pressure. Um, but I do wanna talk about saturation for a minute because I've kind of pulled, I've pulled off of um, posting as much <coughs> on social media and I've created a whole thing on my website called Five Doors because I just started to, I started to feel like um, I was getting sick of art, which was super sad. That made me really, really sad because there's so much that was coming at me with the thumb, the thumb spin on my phone and the scroll on my, on my desktop. And it just became like, how, how can I deal with this? Do you, do you ever feel that way? Do you feel sometimes that you're just oversaturated by so much, even good material, that it becomes almost bland? I do, yeah, I do. And I, I, I think that um, that's, a, um, that's a very real problem to, to have. Um, and, it's not, you know, and it's not something that's relegated exclusively, exclusively to us musicians. I think people in large are, are just, overstimulated by the saturation yes. that exists there you know everybody now has this platform you know a soapbox if you will mm -hmm. to kind of like you know project themselves out and whether it be by virtue of their art or just their their speech or just a meme that they themselves are posting that has been posted you know millions of times more but like we're all allowed that soapbox mm -hmm. and um finding those moments where you can have a break from it you yeah. know it's it, it's really important as not only just as an artist but i think as a, just as a, a human being like putting human. these things down yeah but at the same time that there's there's that addiction factor like you're, yes. you're tired of it but you still pick it up oh it's it's cigar it's it's like um well you disappeared for a second oh there you are there we go. okay yeah it's it's like um either uh it's like cigarettes, alcohol, cocaine, sex, and mm -hmm. and online online stuff. You know, um, you know, it's just yeah. And, and 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 what is the solution to that? What is the answer to be able to 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 deal with this? Because some people have more addictive personalities than others, and so some of my friends. I talked to somebody just yesterday, and she's she she's off. She, she canceled her accounts, hardcore, you know? <laughs> you went stone cold sober from social media. And she, her, her feeling is she's starting to read books again. She's starting to do courses on AutoCAD and other things uh, on architecture and explore other areas because she was spending so much time, what she, what she felt was wasted time on those platforms because they are created to make us addicted 
to, to keep us on there. And, um, and then we, you know, the whole weird psychology of being addicted to likes and the, everybody knows about the serotonin releases and all this uh, bump, you know, and your spike in your happiness for a, for a, temp, for a temporal fix. <laughs> and I don't know, man, it's just, I like the idea of pulling away from it right now. You know, it's almost like these things are all experiments. Nobody has some clear answer on this. You kind of just have to experiment. So for, for me, Five Doors this year gives me a chance to work on a few solid pieces that I'm going to release on the first of each month. And that's my gallery. That's what I offer. And I'm not going to spit things at people at a million miles an hour. Um, whether or not it sticks and how it's going to stick, I don't know. I mean, what's your, what's your philosophy on that and thoughts on that? I think it's it's becoming more and more incumbent for artists um, of all mediums to be able to usurp a little bit more authority over what happens to our art, you know. And I, I think we've talked about it before, but like you know, you you as a musician, you the game is to get your music on Spotify and iTunes and to have right. substantial numbers. Like that's mm -hmm. that for us. That's for some reason that's become the priority versus you know making 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 a living off of your art or or making a connection or an impact with your audience mm -hmm. um and we spend so much time and effort in trying to get you know getting getting the music out there and trying to play spotify's games but we don't realize that like we're only doing them a service we're, we're helping them out far more than we're receiving um than, than what we're receiving from them even yeah. if you put a song out there and say you get a uh, hundred followers following you um you don't have access to those hundred followers right. you don't know you don't know who they are you you can't reach back out to them and say hey i've, I've got this other thing i would love for you to see you don't have access to that but mm -hmm. spotify does Mm -hmm. And we're constantly doing things to generate and drum up more business for Spotify and Facebook and Instagram. We're constantly doing that without mm -hmm. realizing that, like, mm -hmm. we may never ourselves have the level of numbers, receive the level of numbers that we would get from those platforms. Mm -hmm. But you have far more of an opportunity to make a living off of doing this thing yourself i mean even if it is like you do this thing and you you only have a hundred people who like your art but th that's a hundred a hundred people who you know you know this guy you know david you know tom you know mary jane you know these people and they know your art so when you send out um when you send out an email you know a text message or however you connect with this group of people you know that they got it and you know that they will in most instances acquiesce to whatever it is you've asked them to do whether it is to buy this song or here's a t-shirt or here's a, here's a book a short story whatever it is you now have access to that and that's far more important and powerful than it is to have a hundred thousand or even a million streams on Spotify. So I, I think your idea about creating a platform for yourself, for you mm -hmm. and other like-minded people to enjoy, mm -hmm. I think that that's pretty much the goal for all of us musicians. We all need to kind of start creating these processes by which like we have a new, more meaningful connection with our, our fans, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, and, 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 and in, in, case of, in, in the case of the scroll and the oversaturation, it just, if it's not enjoyable, there's a big problem there. If art is becoming bland and... and, and, and um, commonplace. Commonplace, and not, we're not absorbing it in a spiritual way. I'll, I'll say it that way. I, when I go to the museum and I sit down in front of a piece of art, I like to absorb it for... 15 minutes and just be with it be with be with that piece of art and so during this whole pandemic thing it's been sad because i haven't been able to connect with art in that way even going to shows and things like that and so i think part of the reason i started five doors is because i was longing for the gallery i was longing for even the church or the temple where you meet with people and you share something and so when I created that space, it was with that feeling in mind that I want to create a space where 
somebody could be with my art, not be in a scroll next to all of these other things, including shitloads of advertising that's coming up them 100 miles an hour on all sides. Um, how can you have a spiritual experience with a piece of art, a piece of music, a piece of writing, if you're, if you're in this swirling, weird mindset of, oh, the next one, the next one might be more interesting, the next one might be more interesting. I don't, I don't want to be that kind of a human. The question is, is that, um, is that just so old school that it's never going to resonate at all, you know, in, in the modern world we live in? That's an interesting question. You know, how, how is this going to connect with the new human? <laughs> you know, uh, because the new human is different than the old school human, <laughs> I think. I think so. Maybe not, you know. I, I think, um, you know, like I've said, I think that there is a audience for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think that people will consume your content however they consume it. Mm -hmm. I think to a certain degree, while I, I, I do very much am a firm believer in you need to have a space for your art where you are the gatekeeper of, mm -hmm. um, it's not to say that people won't enjoy it on any of those other platforms. I mean, your, your videos are on um, YouTube and from what I have seen, they all do pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they do exist there. So for those people who love to consume art there it, it is there for them that's, a, that's an interesting point because when i have a youtube experience it's different than an, than an instagram or facebook experience for me most of the time because when i click onto a video there i'm absorbed in that space just that space because i'll put on full screen mode right that's what mm -hmm. i usually do i put on full screen mode and i'm in that world for however long i'm in that world so i do I do feel like maybe there's a difference between those two uh, or those, those spaces. There, there is. And I mean, that's the other thing to kind of consider for, for us as artists is to know that like Instagram, you have to understand these platforms completely, mm -hmm. you know? So when you're playing the game of like putting content out there, mm -hmm. you have to understand what, what it means. So for example, like, um, Facebook and Instagram, um, TikTok and all of those things, instant gratification. Mm. It's, it's, you know, 19 seconds or less of a thing. And mm. that's how much they're consuming uh, mm. of that. Mm. So if you are an artist and you know that like, these are the rules that govern what success looks like here, can I create something that will satiate this audience on this yeah. platform, yeah. you know? And, mm. and if, if not, then fantastic you just you stick to the to the places where you tend to do your your best work at now you're definitely right with regard to like people watching um content on youtube and watching it completely or just consuming it more completely or more meaningful and the reason for that is is because they go there specifically for that mm -hmm. when they're looking for a music video or they're looking for something they're mm -hmm. going there for that and the problem with these other platforms is because the viewership is so large, we tend to cram everything there. You know, 80% of the world is on Facebook. So we look at that number as thinking like, that's a great opportunity to advertise something or to show ourselves, to put our art out there because 80% mm -hmm. of the people mm -hmm. are out there. But mm -hmm. again, we're forcing like, first forcing this circle object into a, a square peg. And you, you have to be able to like, understand that if you're going to do that yeah you will eventually find your audience there and be able to to kind of rein them into your to your medium your preferred media mm -hmm. you will get some mm -hmm. so that's fine yeah. um but if you're looking for like any kind of grand success in those platforms mm -hmm. you have to be creating content that works for those platforms and yeah. then you can then use that to bring people into these other uh, things but um you know, <sighs> well, it's 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 like um, the question I'm always asking myself, too, is, well, here's here's the here's the thought I had about, you know, what Instagram and what social media is. It's like in let's say they were in this room where I'm at. There's there's it's packed with people like 30 people around this room. OK, and they're all facing the center and they're all screaming at the same time. Look at me. 
I mean, <laughs> that's to me a lot of the time what it feels like with some of these social media platforms. Everybody, whether they're posting pictures of their cereal, their dog, their kid, their music video that they spent five grand to make, you know, whatever it is, people are, you know, screaming. And so it's, it's almost feels like overall, what, how do I enter this world in a, this new world? Because it is really new when you think about it. When you think about how long television was existence, cable TV, the internet, and then these new forms of, of, of sharing things. They haven't been around for that long. I think we're still adjusting to them and we're figuring things out. Um, Maria Popova, who, who runs Brain Pickings, she believes that these social media things will become obsolete and a thing of the past once we recognize how destructive they are. That's her opinion. And I don't know, I've thought about that. You know, I thought that's interesting. And I'm having more and more conversations with some of my friends about how their relationship to it and, and whether or not we're going to, you know, continue in the same way we have or not. Mm -hmm. I think that the biggest part of all of this is in realizing that, like, we have to understand what people are doing when they're just scrolling from instance to instance, you know, like, I mean, on one hand, yeah, they're looking for gratif instant gratification. And we're talking exclusively, exclusively on the perp, the people who are looking for things, you know, not necessarily creating anything and putting it out there or posting, whatever. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, everyone is looking for a tribe. Everyone is looking for something mm -hmm. to belong to, mm -hmm. or at the very least, looking for something that represents them. So something that they can share and be like, this is who I am, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. So this is why you see memes doing so well, because like they can find a meme that shows who they are and they can share that meme in five um, seconds in five seconds but that that it, to me seems like the dumbing down of the human race to, well, to, I mean, reduce your reduce your your whole spiritual intellectual and and moral self to five words you know well but that's just that's one aspect of it though like i mean you've had lots of uh people share share your art and again like because everyone is looking for a thing to be a part of, they're constantly on the hunt for mm. something that they can see themselves in or something that they want to be a part of, mm. you know? So that's why you still have to kind of play the game to an extent. You still have to mm. kind of put your stuff out there. Mm. You still have to do that because like there's an audience of people out there who are looking for you. They want to mm. find you. Mm. They want to find you. And you're right. You know, like the social media platform is just a like a huge group of people screaming, like, look at me, look at me. Yeah. But inevitably, someone sees them and someone sides with them. Someone will stand with that person with weird green hair for the sake that they have weird green hair. And that's who I want to be aligned with. I'm going to stand next to that person. We're all looking for connection, connectivity mm -hmm. on, on, these, on these platforms for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, again, either by virtue of something we want to be a part of or something that shows who we, who we are as an individual. Mm -hmm. So it is incumbent upon artists to again have a place for their own art that they can kind of control their audience that they can kind of funnel them to but make no mistake you you need to find your tribe and your tribe is out there on the whole social media thing and it is a discouraging thing you know when you put out like something that you've labored over something that you've loved for months and months and months and like you get like 14 likes 15 likes nothing you know but like yeah. these these numbers they they eventually they they snowball by virtue of consistency mm -hmm. like you mm -hmm. you know and and therein lies the truth i i think that social media shows us these other people's likes and and things like that and we see that and we're constantly comparing ourselves mm. to them like that's mm. what success looks like because now we see numbers and we're like that's definitively what success looks like mm. but like not necessarily and i you know, I've been in studios with lots of like really big named artists doing session work. And, you know, the amount of money that they make, you would be like, man, that's crazy, the amount of money they make. But they also spend a lot of money. And in most instances, when you're looking at what it is you have, you know, the volume of things you have in your buying power, and you compare it to theirs, you're, you're kind of seeing that in, in a lot of respects, you guys are the same people. Um, mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, the truth is, is we should not be comparing ourselves. If you're an individual and you're creating unique art 
why is it, why the hell do you need to know what like you know <laughs> what why would you compare it to like the numbers that Kim Kardashian is getting? Or why are you, why would you com- mm-hmm. compare compare mm-hmm. it to Kanye West's numbers? You know, yeah. like yeah. it's we just have to remember as artists that it's hard to get ahead when you're constantly chasing shadows. Well, I, I do. I guess that's the conclusion I've come to is that that I don't even want to be a part of that illusion. You know, I don't want to be a part of that. In the big picture, what is progress? You know, what is you have to kind of constantly ask yourself that, you know, and I don't want to grind that into the ground. But I, I think that that's that to me in, when I'm looking at this, this pig in, in Black Dove, it's kind of the, the, what I'm putting out there, you know, and, all, and everybody has to determine what that pig is and if they are that pig and to what extent they are that hog in their own consumption. You know, what, how am I playing that role within my own life, in my own community, with my own friends, with my own comparisons that I'm doing? And what's, is it satisfying? Is that role satisfying? You know, and um, so for me, you know, art is a lot of the time in a simple, in a basic way, working with these kinds of questions for myself. Like, how do I relate to the world? How am I an American? Am I, I'm an American. How, what kind of American am I? You know, uh, when I travel, when I travel overseas, I, you know, I often am glad when people don't recognize me as, Amer- as an American because Americans have a bad rep- reputation as travelers. They're not necessarily the the most kind and respectful travelers. They're, they can be demanding. And so I don't want to be that kind of an American. You know, I want to be a different kind of an American. America is also a country that has helped a lot of other people, too, on, its, on another side. I'd rather be that kind of a, that kind of a person. You know that kind of a if I'm going to label myself uh, as, a, as an American, you know. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, on a side note to that, the um, one thing I wanted to bring up that if, if people want to explore this a little a little more, um, there's a French guy that came over here when he was just 26 years old, and this is the 1800s. Um, I'm trying to look for uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. And he did a whole analysis on America and American culture and how democracy works here. And I, I highly recommend checking that book out and looking at it and, and kind of examining America from an outsider's viewpoint and seeing what, how, we're, how we were perceived back then, which is really still relevant for today, uh, I think. Right. Well, that's, um, I think, um, I, liked th- I like how all of this kind of brings us back to, you know, what this video kind of means for you and who the characters are, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, Would you say that, would you say right now, more more than ever, how important is video uh, with music? Like, I mean, how, is it, is it, is it as important in what you're doing and what you're striving to do artistically since you can wear both hats? how important is video? Well, <clears throat> I've always kind of been a visual learner and, you know, in school. And, and if I want to figure something out, I'll go click on a YouTube video to figure out how to adjust my water heater in the house rather than read something. That's just kind of how I, I see it in pictures. And so um, I think I like the way storytelling is being pushed with music videos right now and how it people leave the, they'll kind of leave the song. I don't know if you've noticed this, but they'll leave the song and they'll go into the story. And so uh, I've had visions of that kind of storytelling more and more. And I think, you know, in the next few years, I'm gonna be exploring how to synthesize this, this thing uh, in a way that is, 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 more, is satisfying. Um, I think the conventional music video is, I've done that now quite a while, and I like it still, but I want to push into something else. Um, And I think, you know, we're going to see what that is. (laughs) You know, we're going to see how that, 
that storytelling changes. And I think the next the next big thing though is, <clears throat> is that um, is uh, virtual reality. I think is going to usurp um, you, the way you know the way that the telephone was invented and then people stopped visiting their neighbors as much. Then <laughs> came the television and people stopped going out to shows and stopped reading as much. And then we have filmmaking and it became more and more interesting. And then there came gaming and gaming then began to take kids away from television shows. Gaming was way more fascinating. I think virtual reality is the next big step that's going to take everybody out of social media potentially and put them into these worlds. Because there's a guy I know that just got himself a headset and, and like three or four times a week, he'll go hang out. He loves architecture, right? He'll go hang out in this modern building that's built on the side of the ocean, all virtual reality where he can look 360 degrees around him and every up and down in every which way and meet other virtual reality bots <laughs> that have their own avatars in this world. And how can you, can, how can you if you want to call it compete, how can you compete with an all absorbing world like that? Um, I think it probably has a pretty good chance of, of catching on as the next step because that's the way humans are. We want the next interesting thing. And for a while it's been social media, but I think these, I don't know how, I think that to me, that's going to be the next step. Okay. Well, I mean, whether or not um, I'll it, be part of that, I don't know. You know. I don't know if I want to be part of that. I might just go start painting pictures and just do that the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm serious too, man. Oh, uh, I, I think in, in, in that regard, you know, you'll, you'll probably see your, your pictures or videos um, digitalized and they can be stretched upon. Uh, they, they can be there, you know. Uh, That's true. That's Chel true. Yeah. So Chelsea Baker, she plays bass in my band. She's a wildly talented artist. She does paintings as well. And she's had... Um, she's had several of her art in, uh, you know, in like these kind of digital kind of um, they're, they're showcased digitally, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, you have like this kind of virtual tour through like, you know, an art museum and you get to go in on the computer and you move around and then mm -hmm. you get to see her art all on this wall kind of con thing. Con so, con content is still there is what you're saying. Content is it, still, it needs to be there, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. It, it is in, it, artists will there still will be a place for us to create and yeah. i mean it just means that like people will be consuming it differently um mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and it's a good uh, point that's a fair point um i guess it just goes back to like saturation and what where i want to be with it you know where where i want to be with the the amount of content but we've we've kind of gr gone over that a lot <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, but let me ask you a question. So, so the next question is, so you've answered the question is, is video important to what you do, um, mm -hmm. you know, as a musician mm -hmm. and, um, there's a, there's a degree of tribalism that exists in both your music and your visuals. Um, mm -hmm. can you, can you expand on that a little bit? And, and real quick, I do apologize, but my phone's going to die. Plug in this charger. There we go. Are we good? Cool. Yeah. Um, well, so when, tri when when you say tri tribalism, um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Uh, wh what do you mean by tribalism? Well, like, I think in terms of um, with regard to the music, like, I, I, there's a lot of hand percussions. You know, you, you see that in there. Mm -hmm. And then in the videos, there's always these groups of people and um, almost kind of culty, for lack of a better word. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. But that again, that's that's my perspective of it, you know. Um, no, but I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated to hear this because I don't know if you well, described it this way. Well, it, there is like, I mean, um, so. I've performed with you and I've done, I've had a chance to listen to quite a bit of your music over the years. 
And there's an interesting thing you do like with hand percussions and certain types of spirituality, like those things kind of like uh, they're in, in, your, in your music, um, perfumed with it even like uh, as, as I would see it. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I, I always see in your videos, there's a group, there's a, this group of people and they are like this and you are like this kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how best to articulate that, um, but like, I, I always see that, you know, especially, you know, the hand percussions and things like that. You hear that in the music, mm -hmm. even in a song like uh, Black Dove, where like <clears throat> from a uh, composition standpoint, mm -hmm. it's a, um, it's an electronic song. It's, you know, it's for, it's an electronic song, but over the intro there, and uh, I think others, um, parts sparsely you know you hear like the uh what are they like congas or, or, or things mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. um but that's a trend in your music i've found hmm. um <clears throat> it depends i've written a, a lot of different types of music so it, it kind of sometimes i'll just write with the guitar and be a more songwriter type of thing with black dove for sure it's mostly electronically produced with yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think back now, but I think primarily and then but but then the, the electronic sounds that are brought in are there are some hand percussive type sounds and things like that. And then the the backup singer, you know, the singing the ooze, um, wonderful singer out of Sacramento, um, whose name is escaping me, unfortunately, right now, that which is which is horrible. Um, she, she sings a lot of jazz in Sacramento and I'll put her name down in the down in the notes below our video here, but she she brought this beautiful element to it. Um, when I think about tribalism, the way I conceive of it is that um, tribalism is something we can evolve past. <laughs> we can go beyond tribalism. I think in the last four years, a certain kind of tribalism sprang up in America and maybe around the world where people ha define themselves so strictly according to a political tribe. And I felt like earlier when I was talking, I was defining myself as part of a tribe because I was taking a strong look at Trump. But I'm not, I'll take a strong look at Biden too, and, and Kamala Harris, and I'll take a strong look at everybody who's in charge and get and with a critical eye and with hopefully also uh, an eye that, you know, gives them credit for what they're doing if I agree with it, if policies uh, if there are policies I agree with. So I tend to w want to evolve past tribalism in a way. That doesn't mean I don't want to connect with people and, and form bonds and experience things together. Um, but I think you and I might be defining tribalism in, in different ways, almost like a cultural ethnicity versus a group that isolates itself from somebody else. I think those are two different things, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> for me, you know, when I see somebody, I don't care if they're black, brown, red, blue or green and they but they excite me and they they bring this energy to me. I want to work with them. Um, there's just something that turns me on, for lack of a better word, you know, that I, 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 I got to work with this person. I hope they'll work with me, you know. It could be, you know, I anybody, um, old, young, uh, male, female, black, white, green, brown, brown, blue. I don't know. You know, um, I don't know if I answered your question about tribalism, though, as you were as you were um, defining it. Okay. Well, I mean, it's. Um, I, I think I, I think that you know ultimately. There's a there is a there's a general theme um, to to a lot of the the music you you do, and um, and I think it's uh, I, I I've always found it to really be able to um, see it best or understand it best when paired with the the videos or or in me knowing you. Like if I hear a song of yours, I feel like I have like a greater understanding of it. Um, 
you've got a few lines in here and uh, mm -hmm. in this particular song where at the end you say, you know, I think you said, um, I quit my job. I walked the straight and narrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's this cool scene at the end where like you're taking your, you're taking your tie off and you're kind of throwing in, you're walking away. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question to you is like, have you been, have you done that? Like in real, in real life, how close are you right now in your life to that character at the very end of the, at the very end of the video? That question is, is, is fascinating. And, and, and here's what happened to me is I, I just, I quit my, you know, that guy essentially in that video is the chauffeur for the pig. Mm -hmm. uh, and so throughout my life, I've always had to ask myself, am I being the chauffeur to the pig? This is kind of like a lot of what our conversation has been about today is how do I enter the world as an artist and feel like I'm, I'm living according to my beliefs, my, my spiritual beliefs, my ethics, my morals. Um, and then, you know, I did quit my day job. <laughs> so yes, to answer your question, I, I, was, I was teaching and then an, an opportunity came up to be able to quit that and to just do art full time. And I got to say, man, you know, I had a birthday last <clears throat> couple weeks ago and I'm, I'm probably living the life of my dreams now as much or more than I ever have as far as time. Because what we need as artists or maybe what we need as humans is time. You, you, you need time to create something. And that means that you can't just go paint a million miles an hour or write your song in two days. Sometimes it comes that way, but sometimes you need to just saturate yourself in it. You need to absorb, you know, the art. Um, does that make sense? And so when I, when I took, was taking my bow tie off as the, as the driver of that limo for the, for the swine, um, <laughs> I felt like, you know, that's kind of what I've done in a way. Yeah, in the last few years more and more. And I feel like it's, it's I'm, I'm blessed and lucky that that has been able to ha happen for various reasons. Okay. Now, and, the, and it's perfect because that leads me into the, to the next question. So like uh, from the time that I've known you, you know, initially you were here in Sacramento and now you've, you've kind of gone to the desert. How has your new environment kind of infect, uh, affected your artistic perspective? The first thing it's given me is time and space, literally, literally space, because where I live, there's hardly anybody around me. So when I go write a song and I sing it, let's say I'm using a guitar for this one, I'll go out to the canyon on my little, excuse me, deck, and I'll just blast it out. And I don't feel like I'm bothering anybody. And I feel like I'm just sending it out there and feeling it. And I also, I'm, I'm living by myself right now. <laughs> so it's, it's quiet and there's space to do things. And the environment here matches my soul. Uh, it, I look out over the horizon and I see distant mountains. I see the desert plains. I see some desert vegetation. And it just suits my nature. And also there's a community down here of artists that are um, amazing, actually. And there's a, there are a lot of amazing artists in Sacramento, too. It's, it's what, I guess that's not surprising. What's surprising is that you can be in the middle of the desert out here somewhere, and there can be so many artists around that create things. Um, little movie nights out here that you're, you're watching movies on a 16 millimeter black and white from a person who created this uh, in Europe, and then they'll come through this town because people love it here, and they'll screen it and they'll talk about it to a group of like 15, 20 people. And to me, that's like heaven on earth. I'm like, are you shitting me? This is, thank you for letting this happen, you know? <laughs> but I think the environment definitely does affect um, wh who I am right now. And, and, and in fact, whenever I think of creating a, a music video, the first thing I think about is location. That will be the first thing. That's, mm -hmm. that's even almost probably before or at the same time as the characters start dropping in. I want to, where's the world? Where are we living? Where, what are we inhabiting? 
And that to me is the biggest character of all because it's, it houses us, it, it's where we inhabit. Um, and so I love to find new locations that I haven't been in and the spirit and the feel of the, uh, what's haunting the room, you know, who's died in there, <laughs> you know, who's been born in there. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I like that. I like that. I like that response. Um, my, my last question that I have and, um, is so the the video came out in uh 2017 mm -hmm. january 20th okay now my my question to you is this looking back on this video um what would you change what would you change with the music what would you change with the video is, is there anything you would change yeah i mean <laughs> I, the music, I don't think I change anything with the song. I think I, I love that song still. It feels right. Um, it may be some things with the mixing a little bit. I might up some, I might up some things and turn things down. But when it explodes into that, I eat your heart out, I eat your heart out. I mean, that just sets it up for me in terms of what I really believe, even though it's very, it may seem abstract. That's always what I'm trying to get at. I want to get at my heart. I want to get at your heart. That's what I want to get. I want to get past the bullshit that kind of clouds us up here sometimes and get at the heart of the matter. And so I'm going to eat your heart out. I'm going to cannibalize it. <laughs> and so the song with the video, um, I like it for the most part. There are some things I did with color that I would do differently with the with the sat with some of the saturation. Um, I think some of it, I just, I would pull back with some of the saturation I did on some of the clips because it goes into this place that, I don't know, maybe that was the, maybe that was just the trend at the time. You gotta be walk careful of the trends of the time, you know, you, I don't know. It's inevitable to be part, you, we're going to be part of the trends of the time, whether we like it or not, but I kind of like to abide in this space that is classic in a certain sense um, because I think the story becomes clearer at that point. If you, if you, if you, if we add so much to it, that's, it becomes about the effect more than the story. And for me, I'm always trying to tell a story and I really want people to, to hear this story, whether they agree with me or not, you know, or whether they, even interpret the story the same way I do. I don't care, but I want you to hear the story, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I guess that um, those are my changes or non-changes I would do. Okay. Yeah. And so that's a... Uh... <clears throat> and you did all of the you did all of the editing in in the box and things like that yourself? Yeah, yeah, I I started to editing became something right around that time cuz I had a I had a guy edit my first video uh, send out the call. He did an amazing job. And then he did my second video, I think it was the second one, Iscariot Confessions. Really talented editor. And then I started diving into it and learning myself, self-taught there and um I started to discover that it's one of my favorite parts of the process. Being there alone in a room with all of these characters and all of a sudden you get to recreate it again. And, and things happen that, um, I'm not sure exactly how the universe and God and everything works, but I do believe there's something there and I believe it works through us in ways that is uh, maybe unconscious but there in in a different part of our body conscious and because i'll have things that i lay down on the timeline and all of a sudden it will become useful when i wasn't planning on using it and that's happened so many times that i'm starting to believe that i'm actually doing it subconsciously and putting it there without knowing it and later it's useful have you had that happen you're nodding your head yes so i mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'll like dra yeah, like drag a clip up there and just put it there for um, to just have it there for a second, you know, and then I'll, I'll go back and it'll happen to be the thing that shows. And I'm like, what? You know, like, what the <laughs> fuck? Like, that's amazing. <laughs> and, <laughs> that's just like joy supreme, man. I mean, 
that's uh, I get off on that. That's like the most that's the magic when the magic happens with art and you're just like, you know, OK, thank you. Whoever, whatever it is, whoever it is. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's always fascinating when those those things that were only ever intended to be a placeholder, you know, you're like, all right, let me just put something. I'm just going to put this clip right here for right now because I, I know I have to do this other thing. Mm -hmm. And then you come back to it and you're like, it just works. It just yeah. works. It's like, you yeah. know, is it is it divine intervention or is it, yeah, is it the subconscious operating at a, uh, a, a, at a, at a higher level understanding that you're going to need that there? You need to put it there. Right. You know? But uh, I think that the one thing, though, that, that all artists have to have is that, that degree of knowing when to surrender you know like you know when you see something like that 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 happened outside of the realm of like something you your intention but it works you're like okay that just works all right i don't need to mess with that i'm just that's where it wants to be surrender yeah. i give up and then move on and um mm -hmm. that's that's really great what kind of um what kind of advice would you actually give to to other artists who may not necessarily be following you know the the traditional path with regard to music you know like or or, or even videographers because i imagine that of the people who who follow you there's there there is rich and ripe with artists you know it it, it seems like um artists and psych artists and psychiatrists <laughs> <laughs> and i'm not and i'm not lying <laughs> um <laughs> Well, well, you know, th <laughs> that's a great question. Thanks for asking. And um, I would say the, 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 my journey has been one of uh, continuing to surrender to the beauty of the process. Because I spent a lot of years in the angst land of desiring success as it was being handed to me through the definitions of the world around me. Uh, and that can basically cause you a lot of agony and grief if that is your main focus, if that is somewhere even at the 50-50 mark. Um, I would say absorb yourself in story, absorb yourself in in the process and realize how beautiful it is when you're getting to work with a group of people on any given day, when you call in a musician and they're playing a bass line for you, it's a blessing, it's a gift that they come and spend time with you, even if you're paying them, it's still a gift. And, and, when, they, and when an artist I'm working with, the, when the light goes off, I was just recording, um, I was producing my last song in a beautiful studio out here with my friend, uh, Pat Kearns, and, um, and his studio is Goat Mountain Re Recordings. And he started to work with me and all of a sudden he started thinking of a guitar part and he started thinking of a way to create this sound that went with a lyric. And I could see his whole body and spirit light up. What is more than that than me and Pat in the studio and his spirit getting turned on by something that I happen to write, and then he be, and then he starts to add to, and it becomes two spirits commingling in this universe that we've created. I'm like, thank you. There's nothing better than that. If it goes out to a million people, thank you for that too, because that I'll accept that too. That's awesome. But to say that, and the, and the, here's where the beautiful part of it is, I can create that. I can keep creating that until I drop off the face of the planet and I'm buried. Do you know what I mean? I can continue to do that. I don't have to wait for anybody else to tell me how awesome it is to experience something like that. You know, and so also the other thing I would add to that is read. The art of reading, the art of becoming a good reader. I'm still working on that. But books work on our imagination in ways that nothing else does in my opinion an author can bring you because what it does is you're you're working with those words but then you're recreating those words in your imagination through usually pictures or feelings or sensations and so the more you can read stories or whatever read the wall street journal you know uh, read people magazine i don't know you know these ideas come and you you get to recreate them again that's beautiful no yeah that's 
that that's important. And I think that ultimately, along with that being great advice, I think that it's an excellent exercise in, in creativity for, for, for all artists of, of all mediums. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And before and before we before we leave our, our conversation together, I want to ask you a couple of questions, if that's cool. Oh, please, um, please. Yeah, because I want to ask you the same question that you asked just asked me. But I also want to ask you before that, um, when you cr when you create. Um, what are you hoping to and maybe you're not, I don't know, but I'll, I'll pose the question this way and then you might have to reinterpret the question according to your your what you're doing as an artist. But are you wanting to experience something or and if it's so what what is that what are you kind of getting at and also along with that what are you hoping other people are experiencing because you share your stuff you share your work you put it out there some artists just write the song and they never put it out right um <clears throat> I'm a big believer in, uh, you know, that Maslow's uh, hieratical theory, you know, you know, about you, you have the, you have your needs, but at the very top uh, of it is self-actualization. Right. You know? Right. Um, so I do it because, and what I get out of it is, I feel like this is what I was like meant to do. You know, mm. like this is what, by, by virtue of like my design, I am adhering to the design by which, whether it is a biological imperative or a spiritual one, like that I don't know. Mm -hmm. But like, I know that before doing this, I never wanted anything for my life. I never, I was never interested in anything. I was always bored and extremely sad. And I thought mm -hmm. for sure I would have a job, just, just a job working for the mm -hmm. rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So when I, discovered music by way of like a fluke it was a complete fluke mm. um there was a college class i had dropped one class and the only one that would take me two weeks into the semester was uh was a music class a guitar class and i went to the teacher and asked him if i would if he would let me in his class and he's like two weeks into a semester that's unheard of but i'll do it and he says, as long as you can be here tomorrow with a guitar. And it was just something I was doing. I was going through the motions. Mm. Um, everyone told me that I would be good at being a psychologist. So I was going to school for psychology. I had no interest in it, um, but I was just mm. doing it to because I needed something to do. Mm. So the next day I show up with a guitar and uh, the teacher goes around and he's uh, tuning everybody's guitar strings. And he says, all right, we're all going to strum this chord. He goes around the classroom now. It's 24 kids in the classroom. He puts everybody's hands in position. He says, I'm going to count down from three. And you're all going to strum. He says, three, two, one. And everyone in the classroom, it's a very small classroom, 24 people strummed an E minor. And there was a level of reverberation from those small walls from the 20 some odd kids strumming mm. just single strum and it it shook me to my core mm. and uh it uh, 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 awoken this thing in me mm. so i do it um i do it now because like i have to i i mm. I, I i would you know and the truth of the matter is is while i do want success at it while and success for me means that like me and everyone who's a part of this process for with me can can make a, a decent living off of it you know mm -hmm. um and then to, to the point to where we can keep creating um that's what success looks for me uh but make no mistake the truth of the matter is it's like if if there was some sort of divine creator you know some or some cosmic architect who came down today and said you're never going to succeed at this, mm -hmm. then I would still do it because like I have to, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, win, lose or draw. And it kind of feeds into what you said about like, you know, you have to like enjoy the process and you have to fall in love with the process of creating, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I do this because I have to, because if I didn't, then like, I just, I wouldn't have anything else. Mm, mm, yeah, beautiful, beautifully said, and, and and it makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, it seems like some people just have to do it, and that's just the way it is. And I think it's wonderful if everybody finds something like that in life that they feel that way about. Even if they're not an artist, maybe they're an accountant, and they find a way to do numbers that just turns them on for the rest of their days in some 
origami puzzle or something. <laughs> <laughs> something to something to that, that gets you up and you know and it's not you know when you were saying all that i was thinking i was writing this song recently my new song for five doors for next month and it wasn't exactly fun per se you know because sometimes it's not like exact songwriting is always fun like woohoo this is ripping fun i mean so, sometimes it just feels like oh my god this is how do i figure this out you know, and it's it, it can be very, but it's a, it's such a good challenge. You know what I mean? It's such a the challenge is also the turn on. You know what I mean? I think I, I, I think it's it's kind of again incumbent upon us artists to embrace the duality of these situations. Like we don't we don't appropriately appreciate those small victories without like you know the losses you know or and we you, you can't you, you can't love and enjoy the harvest without you know digging and shit you know so it's like we yeah. it, it's just it's part of that and you know the interesting thing though about it is is like there's this part of me that realizes that like so much of my life and and as an artist I, i'm doing it for the the sake of like a future version of myself you know mm -hmm. like maybe maybe that 60 year old version of myself is going to look back at these moments mm -hmm. like even the moments where like i've had my heart broken by virtue of the response that i've received from something mm -hmm. i've created mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. or or an instance where like you know just some small victory whatever it may be but there's going to be that version of myself that future version of myself who's going to look back at this even the heartbreaks especially the heartbreaks and he's going to say what fun mm -hmm. you know hell, so hell yes hell yeah. yeah well i think when you were saying that just now i was i was remembering our show at blue lamp in sack when you played with me and you know? and i was and I was remembering how nice it was to have your presence on stage with all of your beautiful vintage gear, and 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 and, 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 and I have the memory of that that I will never forget. And then I have the memory of two of my other bandmates, like when we were playing at Harlow's, and I remember looking over at Andrew on the keyboards, the guy that played with me for a long time, talented, and and I remember looking over at him playing this tremolo guitar and he was doing his keyboard thing and i'm thinking this is heaven this is heaven on earth thank you for this because since i was a kid i wanted to be in a rock band and i just and you know and and, and maybe there was not a massive crowd at harlow's that night but it happened it happened and it felt so right like you were saying you were born to do stuff certain things it just felt like yeah, I'm here where I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. The number of the people, maybe that's something that's in, you know that I don't have control over. But this feeling right now is um, feels like all the pieces, all the things are lined up. You know, right. and I think maybe that's that's kind of that's that's kind of part of it for us, though, as artists. You know, to give it all you got while you can. And then at some later instance in life, because I mean, that's all we're doing all of this for really is for like, uh, is for some future version of ourselves to either, you know, in, enjoy the, the victories or the, the, the bittersweet defeats. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, there, we're here in the now and we're basing the rest of our lives off of how we're feeling here, believing that this is a reflection of what tomorrow is going to be like, but that the reality is, is like, when you get to that age to where you're retiring, there's a whole nother half of life that ha that happens mm -hmm. that you get to live. Mm -hmm. And right now we're creating great memories for that version of ourselves. And it's like, not only memories, but just like, we're just, really creating a foundation for that version of ourselves to build upon, you know? So there's, mm -hmm. I don't know, we, we have to kind of look at, we have to look at like our, our art beyond the here and the now and mm -hmm. understand that like, one, it's going to live a lot longer than we will, mm -hmm. you know? And two, I mean, you just, you never know. Edgar Allan, po Edgar Allan Poe died believing that he was a failure. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until like hundreds of years later that like he would be celebrated as one of the greatest authors of our time. Mm -hmm. So it's just for some of us, you know, the seed takes longer time 
to, 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 to bloom, to become, mm -hmm. to become a fruit tree, you know, it just, but like, you have to tend your garden. You, you have yeah. to still be there. You still have to, you still have to water it. Even if all you will receive from this is the satisfaction, some future satisfaction, you mm -hmm. still have to do it now. So yeah. it's, oh yeah, that's what do it, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, and, and it, and it takes a while to, 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 um, to get to that sometimes. Uh, I mean, especially, you know, when you're younger too, in your teens and twenties, it's a, there's so much energy there and there's so much, it's a different kind of desire, maybe. Um, but um, all of us have to re reconcile that in our own minds and figure out where, where, we, where we stand with what we're doing and what it's about. Uh, I mean, I feel like when I'm in my 60s and 70s- That's true. I, I mean, I'm, the journey, I, the journey yeah. is different for all of us, you know? Yeah, but. yeah. And when I'm in my 60s and 70s, um, I still am gonna be doing this. I don't know how exactly, you know, like, I don't know to what, but that's what I'm imagining. Maybe, maybe not, maybe I won't be, but I'll be doing something I, I imagine creatively. Some God, sort of vir virtual reality version of all of this. <laughs> it's gonna be in, in 20 years, if we're not blown up, um, it's gonna be a very, I would imagine very different world uh, combined with AI and VR and all of this. I'm excited to see how it goes down um, and to know how I will enter that world in, you know, if, 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 if there will be stints in my arm put in that will, you know, I mean, some, Ray Kurzweil, the guy that pos posits a, a lot of things about the future, um, talks about how death shouldn't exist. You know, and he's he's doing everything he can to take care of himself so that when death becomes obsolete, he'll be conscious, even if he's just a brain bubble controlling a, a machine, <laughs> you know, which they're doing at MIT, which is trippy, you know, just controlling things with thoughts, limbs. So, you know, and that movie Her tripped me out because she was an operating system and she said to Joaquin Phoenix's character, uh, I've gone now to the spaces in between. I've, I've accelerated so fast with my thoughts and my ability to absorb information that I've, I've entered this sort of Zen state. And she, she's like, if you get there, I'll jo join me. I thought that was so beautiful, man. It just feels like what the future might end up becoming. We're all just maybe gonna turn into operating systems that float out into the ether like some sort of little Zen bots that don't have bodies. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a it's a beautiful sentiment, and 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 for me, it's like it, it seems more like um, heaven and absolution exist within the confines of thought. You know, thought alone. Like, and thought is the vehicle for those things. You know, to 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 arrive at those echelons. And if that is true, if it is true, like. You know, we should have the capacity to 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 get there here and now with our thoughts to control yes. to control our, our our destiny here and now by virtue of just you know believing in it. Or, oh yeah, that's you know. the myst. That's what the mystics, to me, of all the great traditions, talk about. And and sometimes it's interesting that the mystics in these traditions we run into them in our daily lives. In, in what seems like mundane uh, environments with people we wouldn't think are mystics. Uh, like, you know, you go to a classroom and you're a student and one of your fellow students seems to have that. I don't know if you've experienced that from time to time. And maybe we all just drop into that mystic realm from time to time and give that to each other. We give each other that mystic vision of what it can be like to live in this space where you are the arbiter of your destiny through your imagination. You know, you can create whatever you want. Um, it's, it's powerful. You know, I don't think there's anything more powerful than that. That's what gives us godlike qualities. You know, our imagination, I think. Oh yeah, I mean, and it, it, depending on what you believe, even from a biblical standpoint, God said that he, he created man in his image and what is he if not a creator? Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of those creation accounts um, 
you know, the, 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 the people that, the, um, the Aborigines going, I think they have the oldest tradition in Australia, the, the Aborigines goes back, I think they have records 50,000 years. And they had this place called the dream time. Um, and the dream time was how they believed the world was created by the creator in the dream space. And I thought, oh my God, I think that might be true. <laughs> I think that might be literally true. That because with quantum mechanics, they're finding, finding out more and more about how our thoughts and what we look at is controlling the electrons and the little things inside the subatomic particles inside the cell. So is it possible that the whole world was created through thought? You know, maybe, maybe it still is every time. Maybe we'll, science will get to a point where we'll be like, yeah, you guys have pretty much been creating your whole world this whole time. That's how it's been going down. And you all bought into this together. So it became a collective weird ass dream. And, <laughs> and you know, maybe, maybe it was fucked up and you should have dreamt something else. <laughs> but anyway, man, it's been, it's been fun creating this dream with you for the last little bit, my friend. And I really appreciate you oh, taking, the time, taking the time, taking the time for your precious time to be here and, and be in this, this little fun little bubble yeah man dude thank you very much for having me on and uh you know it's uh it's it's been an enjoyable experience i mean um <clears throat> knowing you uh throughout the years but then also seeing you know even your art kind of develop and, and, and change and um you know I, i'm i'm eager to see where all of this actually ends up going for the future with you because you know uh you know we're travelers on this thing and i don't think either one of us are are making any any plans on stopping uh this so it's it's only just going to develop more and, and and get better as the years go on so uh again thank you for having me on here and um yeah man please please keep on creating stuff thank you of course i will and and, and it's been wonderful to watch your evolution from we talked about it at the beginning but you know from being a, a musician to a filmmaker to uh, a, a guy who has explored all of the technical sides of these fields in a way that I admire because my brain doesn't exactly work like that all the time. <laughs> and I'm just like, anybody who can dive into that as deep as you do, I'm like, oh shit, I got to meet people like that so I can work with them. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want people to um, to know where they can find your work. Where where can people go to explore your your videography, your, your music, all, everything else that you offer? Well, um... So we'll be actually putting out our first official official music video uh, for for Boy Indigo, and it'll be a song called "Fading In and Fading Out." You'll be able to find it on YouTube. Um, I'm thinking around February 20th. We've got okay. a bunch of other videos that are kind of um, that are actually uh, done, and we'll be kind of put, peppering them out throughout the year. Okay. Um, otherwise, Boy Indigo dot music. Uh, on Instagram, we put a lot of our uh, teasers and things like that um, on there. Uh, likewise, um, we've got like, a, we do the whole like kind of text messaging thing. So we've got like, uh, so if anyone's interested and want to text message uh, me or anyone in the group and have like questions regarding um, wow, that's our awesome. music. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's me. It's made exclusively for just for, for this thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, so if anyone has any questions regarding um, or just want to chat with us or mm -hmm. videography questions, music questions, uh, just mm -hmm. want to stay in contact with us in any kind of way, mm -hmm. um, they can they can find us there. And I think the links for that is like on our on our Instagram. Uh, I'll, I'll shoot you the link and maybe the, the actual phone number. I forget it offhand and you can put mm -hmm. it in the uh the bio section. Okay, yeah, I'll do that for everybody who wants to do, who wants to check it out for sure. That's a cool approach. I think it's really interesting. Uh, it, it's it's kind of like curating a space uh, where people can be with you, which is which is nice. The intimate the the intimacy is what um, is beautiful with the exchange between artist and audience or audience. It, you know, it becomes something else in that step in that phase of the game. You know, which is which I think we long for. I think that's what we miss so much about live shows right now is just that connection with each other. So, right. yeah, but uh, may the future open that door to us. 
uh, all again. So anyway, my friend, thanks again so much. Uh, appreciate it. And I encourage everybody to go check out Devon's work and the work he's doing with Boy Indigo with his band. And I will uh, hopefully see you one day soon in the flesh, my friend. Oh, I'm I'm looking forward to it, man. We got to collab on some fun stuff. I I know this is this is this has to happen. We do too many of the same things not to have that happen on a project at some point in the future. <laughs> okay, my friend. All right, later, brother. Take care.